Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I am your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Paige. Paige is someone who grew up in the United States but is now living in England. Um, so I thought that was a super appropriate topic uh, to have an international guest on uh, Election Day in the United States. It is not nearly Election Day, but when this episode does come out, it will be Election Day. I met Paige when I did my semester abroad in London, so I'm really excited that she is here to talk with me today. So Paige, why don't you say hello? Hi, and thanks very much, Sarah. It's great to be here. Great to be on the podcast. Thank you. I, I super appreciate it. So why don't we start kind of really wherever you want, but in the beginning, whether it's growing up in the United States or kind of that transition of when you first decided you want to move. Sure. Yeah. So I think I'll start from the beginning because I think the desire that I had to move started from a very young age. Um, I actually, even though most recently I lived in Pennsylvania, um, I grew up in Arizona and Washington state. So I've done kind of three out of the four um, U.S. corners. And I think if you think about kind of the regions of the states and how very culturally diverse they are in terms of their geographic regions, I lived in kind of little miniature countries. I've kind of done three countries in the states itself. So I've had these really drastically different experiences. And I think from a young age, then that meant that I didn't want to stop having those experiences and kind of stop that progression. Um, so I knew even probably, I mean, my parents would tell you, but I know at least from high school, I said, when I graduate, when I graduate from university, I'm going abroad. That's what I want to do. And that was my goal. Cool. So when did you first go abroad? So I first went abroad. I think I got my first proper abroad hit. And we're not, I mean, obviously, um, Mexico is, is abroad. And um, when I was in Arizona, it's back when you didn't have to have a passport, actually. There was no no wall, um, so you could just freely move across the border. Um, so that was, you know, the first kind of abroad experience. But for us, that was very much in our kind of back garden. It didn't really feel abroad because that culture was so similar to what you find in kind of the, the southwest U.S. Um, my first proper experience, I think, would be when I was at university, I went to Dublin just for about a week to babysit my cousins. Um, and it was the first time that I'd, even though I was had family there and I traveled with family, it was the first time that I didn't travel with like my parents and my sister, my immediate family. Um, and I got kind of the hit of just that the confidence that you get from being in a different place when you're so, um, when you're approached by something so very foreign in terms of a lifestyle and accents and those sorts of things. Um, and this, the thrall that you get from experiencing it and that also the confidence as well from being there and kind of adapting and understanding. Um, and that then gave me the confidence when I was at university to do a year abroad in Russia. So I went to Moscow for a year um, and it just sparked a love. You know, since then I did, you know, a summer in Uganda. Um, I did my, my master's degree in Kazakhstan uh, where I spent some time in Kazakhstan. Um, and then, you know, I got the idea that post university to, you know, go ahead and continue my studying. I wanted to do it abroad. And that's what brought me to the UK and brought me to England. Um, so I think the thing is with any sort of experience that you have, and you will know this as well from your, your experience of studying abroad in London, you get hooked from the very first instance, you know, from the very first time that you try some kind of new food, um, or, you know, you go up to someone and they say something in a weird regional accent to you, you just get absolutely hooked. And, and it's, I wouldn't say it's downhill from there because I don't think it's a downhill experience, but it's, it snowballs, shall we say snowballs from there. Yes, definitely snowballs, not a downhill experience at all. It's actually funny, when I was first messaging you about recording, you said some phrase, and I was like, you can tell she's been in England for quite some time now because I would not say that phrase as an American. <laughs> it is really... It's a very strange thing because obviously, so the, the, you know, the language is the same. The language is the same... Um, in terms of the fact that it's English, but I get together with um, one of my very best friends from Washington State actually moved to Spain at the same time that I moved to the UK. Um, and it's quite funny because we live closer geographically now than we did when we were in the US at the same time. And we'll get together and she speaks Spanish, obviously, day in and day out. 
And there will be moments where we just completely forget the, like the American phrases for things and words and we just sit there and we go, what was that? I don't know. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. And it's just, yeah, it's quite funny because you do adapt and you pick it up and the longer that you're in one place, you forget how it was in your previous location as well. Quite funny. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's definitely funny uh, to hear that that difference and that struggle with having acclimated for somewhere for so long. So since you're obviously much closer to other countries whose primary language is not English, do you ever find that you're in situations where you can't communicate with other people? For sure. Um, and I think the thing is, I tend to and what I, what I really struggled with when I moved here as well, it, I found situations that I couldn't communicate with other people in English. And that was, that was the really big lesson that I learned. Um, so, for example, I think it's more of kind of a culture shock idea. So, sorry, I'm expanding the question a little bit. That's okay. um, but I'll get back around to it, I promise. I kind of go on tangents, but I'll come back around. Um, but so when I first went to Russia, for example, I was going there for a year and I came very much prepared. I left very much prepared for the fact that it was a completely different language and I had really rudimentary Russian skills. Um, so I wasn't really going to be able to communicate and I was going to have serious culture shock. You know, I went in with the idea that this was going to be very strange and very different and potentially quite difficult for me to, to adapt and to live and to enjoy my time, but worth it. When I came to the UK... I would say that I didn't have those expectations because of the fact that, you know, we, we have this common language um, and, you know, we have this shared culture many, many, many years back. Um, and I had bigger culture shock coming here than I did going to Russia because of the fact, I think, that I didn't prepare for it to be so fundamentally different. Um, just in terms of the overall kind of English psyche, the way that they approach different situations and the way that you explain yourself. So there's a couple of different examples, concrete examples. I came over for a master's degree um, initially in, in England and in my program it was predominantly other English students, so non-American students, maybe a couple of um, continental European students. Um, and I would say something and I would say it in a very American style where I think we tend not to kind of expound and use really serious you know, grammar and go on and on and on in a very eloquent way. Honestly, we tend to be a little, more to, a little bit more to the point and a little bit more focused, shorter words. And I would say something in class and then my friend um, who's English, he would say the exact same thing, but he would use about four more syllables per word than I did. And the, and the you know, professor would look at him and go, brilliant point, Jim. Well done. And I would go, what? <laughs> I said that. I said that. Um, and it's something that I found kind of throughout English culture that even though we're speaking the same language, they say things in a very fundamentally different way to get their point across. Um, and then the other example that I have in terms of kind of being misunderstood is when you introduce yourself to to an English person. When I first got here, I came across very American where I would go in proper smiling. Um, Hi, my name is Paige. Maybe reach a hand up for a handshake. And if you do that to an English person, especially in a pub, anything like that, it is it is like you slapped them. You know, they take a step back. They're like, whoa, this is way too much. And you feel like you have just really peeved them off because that's just not the way that they communicate. So I think those are my examples that even though we speak the same language, there are some ways in which I'm completely misunderstood and I don't understand them as well, um, which come down to kind of cultural differences really, rather than, you know, the, the syllables and linguistics themselves. So do you still find yourself having some of these situations now, even though it's been a handful of years? Yes. <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely and it's it's um I'm trying to think of ways to explain it it's it's still the little things that that I find myself kind of sometimes just getting completely incorrectly um little things about you know just so you know obviously we're living in a time of pandemic which is horrible and every everyone is dealing it with their own ways um but the way of dealing with it in in a grocery store here for example so you know you go to a supermarket it's mandatory that you wear masks here, um, mandatory social distancing. But the, there are little subtle cues that I cannot pick up on yet. And I don't know if it's because I was relying far too much on the lower half of someone's face, um, or maybe I just don't understand. But little things about, you know, if there's a queue to check out, which queue you go into, even though it's kind of marked, I just don't quite understand yet. And I, it's, it's hard, sorry, because I can't give you a really concrete example, but there are still certain things that I go into, and that's when I feel 
very foreign. I feel like I've missed something very fundamental somehow, somewhere. Um, but the thing is, that's why I love it because, you know, in time I will understand it and, and I'll kind of master that. And that's, that's why I love it. That's why I love living here because it keeps you on your toes and it keeps you learning, but also it keeps you open to the idea that there are so many different um, backgrounds out there that you need to be, you know, able to welcome or at least able to, to experience and deal with. Yeah, that's a very funny story. I, I super appreciate it. And it's okay to not have a concrete answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's great. Do any of the people that you hang out with, that you work with or anything, especially maybe like new people that you have to meet, do you ever have to say like, oh, I grew up in America? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, so I think it's quite funny because in, in developing this new persona of me living in Europe, even though we have Brexit, I still say we're living in Europe. Um, it is very obvious that I'm not English. And I'll say that because of the enthusiasm that we as a nation tend to have for any activity, especially the world of work. Um, the smiling that we do just naturally at people to say hello and good morning. Um, and optimism is, it, these are not parts of British culture necessarily. So I think I will never be able to pass for a British person in in you know the UK I never will um so most of them actually look at me and they now think I'm Irish <laughs> so they know I'm not from here <laughs> but they don't quite get American yet <laughs> well you're at least pulling up and I mean like your accent is very clear um at least to me as someone who like doesn't consistently speak to British people and hear different accents so at least mm -hmm. they're they're figuring something out <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's true. It's gone into a very strange accent. I really do enjoy it, though, when I come back to the US because um, people are very nice to people with like an obviously, shall we say Western European accent. Um, so when I go to like New York, I get tons of free stuff because people will say, oh, you're from Ireland or you're from England. Have this for free. And I go, OK, <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> it's like they, they don't need to know the truth. You can take the free stuff. No, nope. nope, I don't tell them. <laughs> Yeah. Now we were talking a little bit before we hit the record button um, and we mentioned the fact that you have a husband who is also who is English, not also English. Mm. Um, so do you want to explain kind of how how that has happened, like the navigating of a relationship from two completely different cultures? <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, so I met my husband when we were doing the same master's degree. Um, so already the fact that we were studying kind of Russian and Eastern European studies, it tells you that we were both very much open to experiencing other cultures. That sounds very dirty. I don't mean that in a dirty way at all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, it, you know, that we were both very open to new cultures. And I met him during the Masters. And I was very lucky that we got on very well. We became friends very quickly through the shared interest of, you know, what we were studying and, and what we were doing. But as well, I think I was lucky that after... Um, we graduated, I was able to stay in the UK because my dad, who is a professor, was doing the Susquehanna um, London Study Abroad program, which might have been your year, actually, that you were there. So I was able to stay on um, because I think if I hadn't had that opportunity of staying in the UK, that things would not have necessarily worked out the way they were just because it was very, very early days. And the thing is, which I've, I think with any sort of relationship and any sort of, you know, affection that you have, it goes beyond culture, which sounds completely corny. Um, I mean, we do tend to approach certain things in very different ways, and we each have our own strengths on that basis. Things like I cannot handle bureaucracy, whereas he absolutely can because it's a fundamental part of English culture. So if there's any ever paperwork we need to fill out or bills, he is your man. He's got it down. Um, whereas I tend to be the one that, you know, if we need to go and ask for directions, that's me because I'm very, you know, enthusiastic and outgoing because of the American side. But I think it's it's really quite quite lovely because in the time that we've kind of been together, of course, you have your challenges being in, in different, you know, from different backgrounds and the fact that my family is in the US. Um, but we've kind of adapted and developed our own little micro culture in our in our household, um, which kind of makes us stronger. I would say it makes that means that we're, you know, more able to deal with with other cultures and any kind of situation that arises as well. We've got more varied perspectives. So it's been it's been a very interesting road, but I think the one thing that we've shared is that love of kind of learning more and experiencing more, and that's the thing that we've continued to do. Um, and even in you know times of pandemic when we're not able to travel abroad, which is one of the things we love to do, 
Um, we can do little day trips around the UK and you still get to experience something that's very different than, than your norm as well at the same time. Yes, that was one of my favorite things about being in London and having the ability to just go somewhere so easily and you felt like you were somewhere completely different. Yeah, yeah, which is fantastic. Love it. And it's it's something that's very kind of, I think, unique to maybe continental Europe, I would say, um, that you have very kind of distinct areas and regions with their own history. And you can you can feel the difference. It might be a half hour drive, which to us in the States is like going to the shops. Um, but here it means that you're in a completely different world. And I love that. Yeah, definitely. Now, you mentioned that like you kind of both bring your own culture to the table. Are you still doing anything super American? The obvious one would be having Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Thanksgiving and also, I mean, this is the perfect time for it because as we record, it's October, um, which means Halloween's coming up. And I love Halloween. And you don't realize when you're in the States that this is a very American holiday. This is not something that's been adopted widely, um, you know, elsewhere. Um, and so from the 1st of October, my decorations go up. Um, anything we watched on the telly has to be, you know, Halloween themed. It's got to be horror. It's got to be something kind of supernatural, something like that. Um, and he hates it. He absolutely hates it. But he puts up with it because he's a good guy. Um, but that is all of my October and I love it. And then it builds up to Thanksgiving. And the nice thing that we've kind of developed with our Thanksgiving um, is that we invite his entire family around for the meal. Obviously, this year might be a little bit different um, because we did it one year because I really I really missed it. And I didn't I was trying to kind of hide the fact, you know, it got to Thanksgiving and I didn't say happy Thanksgiving to anyone because I didn't want to offend anyone. Um, you still worry that they might, you know, might be a bit peeved. Um, they're not. The English are fine with it. Um, but you know, I didn't want to throw it in anyone's face. And so one year, you know, I was tired of not celebrating it. And we had kind of a Thanksgiving dinner and we invited around his parents and his mom came around and we had, we had the meal and we had a lovely chat and that kind of that nice post meal lull that you have at Thanksgiving where everyone's just very open and honest because you can only think about digesting. So everything comes out. Um, and she said, you know, I really like this holiday because they don't have something like that here. And she said, it's, it's like Christmas, but you don't have to do presents. It's not focused on that aspect. And it's really just focused on family. Um, and I said, yeah, ab I mean, absolutely. Absolutely it is. Um, so our Thanksgiving tradition has actually grown on that basis. So now we have Thanksgiving with, with his family and his sisters and his nephews and nieces. Um, and then we also invite um, you know, our friends as well. So we have it, we've kind of expanded it wider. And I've never faced any sort of antagonism on that basis which I love everyone's kind of embraced the fact that it's a nice holiday that that we can all spend together and just enjoy which is great yeah that's really lovely that it's it's expanded and and you've now kind of made it your own and and it's something to look forward to definitely this year will probably as you mentioned be a little bit different um as yeah. as everything is this year yeah yeah for sure and I think it's it's a really difficult thing and it's it's one of those that you know I'm kind of it sounds horrible but I'm kind of glad that I've had the experience of living in a country that's separate from my my media family my parents um because and it's it's what everyone's going to face going into something like the holiday season away from your parents and you know your loved ones can be really really difficult um but I mean, the advice that I have is that the moments that you do have, whether it be over Zoom or over Skype or whatever, just devote 100% of your attention to them. Um, and that's what we do. And it makes it special. And it means that, you know, because you think of kind of a traditional American Thanksgiving, I don't know if it's traditional, but nowadays, half of the time people are sitting on their phones or their tablets or, you know, they're showing people YouTube videos, they're doing that sort of thing. Whereas if you're forced to kind of sit down and look at someone down a screen, you end up having like we are now. Um, you know, some really in-depth chats, you really connect with that other person. Um, so even though it can be difficult not to physically be there and hug someone and, you know, smell their shampoo, which sounds creepy as well, but, you know, it's a lovely thing. Um, you still end up with some moments that you'll really cherish. And I mean, that's, that's the nice lesson that I think I've learned. It's kind of, as we've all going through this horrible time, it's helped to prepare me a little bit more, I would say. Yeah, you definitely have that, uh, that bit of uh, an advantage that you've been doing the mm -hmm. long distance. Now, how has it been with, with your parents, with your sister to be so far away from them? Like we'll say pre pandemic, pre everything <laughs> being locked down. How had that been? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's one of those things that I think 
you know, living here for me is worth it. And I love my life here and I love the experiences that I've had. Um, and, you know, there, there are so many opportunities, even with the pandemic, for me to continue to have that it's worth me living here. But it's hard. It's always hard. Um, and I think we're very lucky that we can be so connected in this day and age with technology. There's no question. But I've missed, you know, some some major milestones. My sister had a baby and I was there a couple of weeks after the birth. But, you know, I haven't I haven't seen my niece since. And she's getting, you know, she's actually going to be two next month. Um, so it's it's difficult, I think, kind of being away from family. But it's something that I think we all experience. And it's the same in the States as well, that, you know, people move to California and the time difference is, is very similar, you know, I mean, in terms of time to travel is, is very similar. Um, so I think it's the same lesson that, well, not lesson, but it's the choice that we all have to have at some point about what we find the most important, you know, what, what is most important to us. Um, and I think at the moment, kind of living here, this, this life is worth it for me. But the great thing is that obviously pre-pandemic, I could travel easily over there. Um, and, you know, and I had times where all I wanted to do was see my parents. So I just flew home and that's what I did. Um, and I think it's just, it's one of those kind of choices that we all have to make at some point about about what we're doing with life and, and where we want to go and who we want to be. Um, and you, you know, thankfully family loves you. So my parents are supportive of me and you make sure that you still you know, make every moment count, like I said, every Skype meeting count. Um, and that's what kind of gets you through. Yeah. Now, obviously, you mentioned um, your dad being a professor and coming over mm -hmm. to London. And that that's how I met you through your dad. Um, yeah. And now he has since retired. Um, and now we're in a pandemic. Do, <laughs> do your parents or, or your sister, are they ever able to come over and visit you? Yeah. So normally, you know, pre-pandemic time, um, I would go over once a year and then they would come over once a year. So, you know, I'd see my parents every six months, my sister would see, you know, every year. Um, and the, yeah, the lovely thing is that, you know, dad with, with Susquehanna, he was over actually more frequently and for longer periods of time, which was great. I think at the moment it's not necessarily possible, um, just because who knows what's going to shape up in the world. I will say that I'm trying to get them over for, <laughs> the election after they vote because I think I would like them in my house where I can watch them and make sure that they're safe um but I don't think it'll be possible because people have to have to quarantine for two weeks after after flying so it's just it's not going to be necessarily possible but hopefully soon in the future um yeah they'll come over which would be good <laughs> yes the two-week quarantine definitely makes things difficult but it's you know for the safety of everyone <laughs> yeah True. Absolutely. And it needs to be obeyed. There's no question about that. <laughs> now, I mentioned yeah. uh, earlier that this is coming out on Election Day and we were talking a little bit beforehand and you mentioned that you can't vote in either mm -hmm. location. So what does your like what's the citizenship process that you've gone through? Yeah, so the citizenship process is is quite extensive. Um, so I currently am on indefinite leave to remain which basically means that I'm not a, an English citizen or a British citizen, um, but they don't have to kick me out, which is good. So I'm still able to work and I pay all my taxes um, and they can't kick me out, but I don't have the right to vote, unfortunately. Um, so things like Brexit, I didn't get to, to cast my vote for that um, or any sort of the, the elections here. Um, and the sad thing is at the same time, because I don't have a permanent address in the States anymore, I have lost my right to vote in, in the US as well. So I'm a little bit floundering in terms of citizenship. Um, but my, so my classification here, the indefinite leave to remain, that took me 10 years um, on different visas to get. And I had to do a life in the UK test, um, which was hilarious and bizarre and every English person I spoke to couldn't have passed the test because it was really random information about you know 90s sitcoms in the UK and um, populations in tiny villages up north um, random information which apparently the American equivalent is is, is the same um, and I had to do that to get my indefinite leave to remain and then I can now apply for a um, passport which would be great. And it's quite expensive. So I'm going to, I'm going to save up a bit and do that in time. And once I have that, I will be an official citizen and I'll be able to vote. Um, and I'll have myself a nice, a nice passport as well. 
So are you currently, like when you were traveling, traveling on a U.S. Mm. passport? Yes. Yeah. Traveling on a U.S. passport. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah. that's kind of crazy, but I guess it, it does make sense. Are you able to renew that passport even though you don't have a permanent yeah. address? Oh. Yeah. 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 So I did that here. I renewed my passport here. So I'm an American citizen until I, well, not until, I mean, it, in, unless I denounce my citizenship, sorry, <laughs> not until, um, unless I denounce my citizenship. So yeah, I'm absolutely American. I still have to file my tax returns every year. Um, and I still have my passport, even though I don't have an address and I can't vote, um, which is not ideal. But yeah, absolutely. Still American in terms of paperwork. <laughs> and so will you go through that process then to get a, a British passport to become a citizen? I will, absolutely, because the nice thing is I can be a dual citizen, so I can retain my American citizenship and then be an, a British citizen at the same time. So, yeah, for sure, I will. I'm kind of sad I didn't do it a couple of years ago because then I would have been a European citizen. Um, but, yes, absolutely, I will I will do that because I will be able to vote. And um, also it opens up, if we're ever able to freely travel again, I'll be able to travel to some countries that an American passport may not necessarily have gotten me into, whereas an English one is absolutely fine. That's definitely, you don't really think about that when it's not an option. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> so switching gears a little bit, what is the biggest difference that you have experienced living in the UK versus living in the States? Oh, that's such a good question. I think, ooh, let's see. So the biggest difference that I would say, I think that I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give you two. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so, apologies. Um, so, I mean, the first one is I kind of mentioned the bureaucracy and the fact that my husband is so much better at doing paperwork and filling in forms and those sorts of things than I am. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, because it's quite a fundamental part of, of English culture. And one that they probably they necessarily don't realize the fact that it is part of their culture, but I find it strikingly different. Um, and that it is approached in a very different manner to what bureaucracy is in the States. Um, the way that you fill things in, the way that you file mm. things and get things done is, it seems like, you know, we're going, we're starting in the plane, same place, you know, our destination is the same, but we're taking two completely different routes to get there. Um, and it's taking me time and it will always, you know, it will always be a challenge for me to be able to do Simple things like buying a house was a very different process here um, to any process that you would have in the state. So things like that I find very different. Um, and then, you know, as I said as well, the fact that the culture is different despite the fact that we have the same language and, you know, a shared history. Um, the, you know, the optimism or at least perceived optimism that you have with an American um, and enthusiasm is so completely foreign to to the English psyche and the English culture. Um, and I think coming over here, there's this weird period where initially you're obsessed with it. You know, the culture is amazing. You love the way they say things and the way they approach things. Um, and then after a couple of years, you go, God, these people are negative. They're so negative. I'm sick of the sarcasm. And why is it always glass half empty? Come on, people, let's go. Um, and then you start to adjust and you realize that they're not actually negative. It's just the way that they explain things and they approach things. And that is that is the other difference that I find so, so very striking. The fact that, you know, really what, you know, we could be perceived as an optimist and a pessimist in terms of cultures. And we're not. It's just that we have very different ways of approaching situations. Yeah. And I find that that will always be a struggle for me as well. <laughs> always. But I think it's also good that you're able to like realize that difference and that it's not just the glass half empty and it, it's really more of a fundamental thing. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, I hope so. And that's, I think, but it's, it's the same way that, you know, we've all had these experiences, whether it be abroad or be little things like going to high school from middle school, you know, just, just simple little things that you came there, you know, you go into this new situation, you go, whoa, this is really weird and really different. And your first, you know, instinct might be is like, oh, interesting. And then you go, no, I don't like it. And then after a while, you start to understand why it is. And that's kind of when we accept it. And that's, it's the thing about approaching changes, um, you know, in life and 
changes in terms of you know cultural living situations anything like that that they can be little they can be big but they're all very much I think important to us and to making us more well-rounded and understanding um sorry that got a bit preachy <laughs> that's okay <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> you know do you ever run into instances with your husband because obviously like you've been together you know each other really well have you ever run into anything where you say something or he says something and you're like wait I, I don't know what you're talking about yes yeah definitely oh, I'm trying to think of an instance we had one just the other day um where I just looked at him and I was like I Honestly, no clue. I mean, the, the simple, you know, example would be things like television shows and radio programs. Um, they've got a, so we um, had a, a socially distanced outdoor picnic with some friends um, a couple of weeks ago. And they started talking about, oh, I'll have to look up the name of the program. But it's it's a, a sitcom that is done with puppets. And it's... Um, basically like an adult kind of news satire program that is completely acted out with puppets. Um, and they just started talking about it and how exciting it was that it, you know, it was coming back on air and does everyone have BritBox, which I have no clue what that is. Um, and it just very much the whole conversation switched. And I looked around and I was like, I honestly, what in the world? <laughs> what in the world are you talking about? Um, so, so, I mean, this is a simple example, things like, you know, culture, pop culture references that I just really don't understand. Um, but there are some moments as well that he says certain words that I just really don't get, um, which is quite funny. And it's, it's actually kind of a nice thing that we've been together 10 years. Um, and it's kind of nice that you still get surprised once in a while by what, by what your other half is saying. Uh, it keeps you on your toes. Definitely. Yeah. That's that's really cute that it it still happens 10 years later and probably will continue to still happen. <laughs> yeah. And it is nice because I think we're, like I said, we've kind of developed our own, we've assimilated kind of and developed our own little microculture. Um, and it's quite funny because he, he said to me last week, like he was speaking to his mother and she turned around and she said, good God, you're married to an American, aren't you? Um, and I can't remember what it is, but we've kind of adopted these things that make us kind of fundamentally English or American, regardless of, you know, our original status, what have you. And I think it's, that's quite cute. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's also interesting to hear that, like, he's also picked up on those American bits, whereas, like, you're the one who you were living in America. Now you're not. But he's just living with you. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. But I think that's the thing, and it's it's the lovely thing about people in general is the fact that we do just we want to understand each other, and with that, you kind of you you pick out the best of each other. Um, you encourage each other to be the best, but also you adopt those things that you think are great. Um, and I think that's a lovely thing about kind of mankind in general. Definitely, definitely. Now, you mentioned, um, like, in the buying the house process, very different where you are than in the U.S. Have you run into any issues where not being a citizen has been problematic? Absolutely. Um, quite a number. So, first off, getting a job is um, incredibly difficult in, in the U.K. unless you're sponsored by a company. So that is your first way. You work for kind of one of your big, like, American Express. So your big global brands that will um, sponsor you to work there. Um, or you have to be on some kind of visa that gives you the status um, to, to work in the country. And that is very difficult um, because, first off, to be sponsored, the company has to prove that there is no... Uh, UK citizen that can do the job you are the only person that can do this and let's be honest unless you're CEO of like Microsoft it's it's not going to happen there are other people who can do your job um, so that makes it very difficult buying the house um, I did have to go through many more sort of processes to prove who I was um, than an English person would have to they just show the passport but I couldn't just show my passport I had to have all kinds of other proof as well um, and I think you know, the, the status that I have that I'm still not a citizen is something that, you know, I'm, I'm continuously reminded of, um, not necessarily in a negative way, but I think, you know, I didn't think about it until actually we're just chatting now that um, it is a way that makes me feel very much other because I'm not a citizen. Um, because in order to apply for my citizenship, I have to prove that um, I know my husband, that we live together. Um, <laughs> hopefully by now we know each other. Um 
that we share a household. And to do that, I have to do things like I have to have three pieces of mail from like a bill or from the bank, like a bank statement every month that has my name and our address on it. And then I have to find a corresponding piece of mail for him. Um, and I have to do that every month. That is a part of my life is making sure that every month I've got this evidence that we share a household and I need to do that so I can get my citizenship. So it's little little ways, I think, that, you know, kind of change my life and make it more difficult for me to do normal things like get jobs and buy a house. Um, and also kind of it definitely reminds you that you are not yet a native, if I ever will be a native. Yeah, that definitely sounds like it would be tedious <laughs> mm, <laughs> and a consistent nice. reminder as well if you're if you're having to do that every single month. Mm. And bad for the environment, let me tell you, because most banks now, they say, we'll just send them to you electronically. And I have to say, no, <laughs> post them, post them. Um, yes, it's not ideal. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I thought it was difficult for my boyfriend to get a license in Pennsylvania purely because he <laughs> moved in with me and I was already like established as like a mm. renter and like I everything was in my name. So like when we went to the DMV, I was actually one of his proofs of address. Um, Were you? Mm -hmm, he <laughs> like we got him to sign the, the rental agreement. He mm. had his own. And then the other thing was literally me handing over my license saying, I live at this address and here's proof. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, which then I think is what oh. has since caused the problem that like he can't, he can't get a real ID because they were like, well, you didn't use like real address proof. And now we've since moved because I bought a house. So, Good on you. but, yeah. but he has a, he has a passport and we're not traveling anyway. So. <laughs> But it's it's the thing, and it's so funny, and it's such a good point that, like, this is not just, a, you know, a situation you find living abroad. This is something you find in the States. Absolutely. It's something that you find, you know, locally. It's these these weird little local ordinances and, and, I don't know, regulations that you learn about and have to obey by that you just look at and you go, why and why? Why? But it's the way it's always been, and <laughs> you kind of have to learn. So... I think it's a lovely point and bless him for putting up with it. You know, the Pennsylvania DMV is not a lovely place. Um, but yeah, you get it everywhere. You get it everywhere. <laughs> Definitely. Now, the big thing, um, of course, like in any presidential election that we're experiencing and just being in the U.S. is health insurance. Um, so how is it being without American health insurance and, and being in Fantastic. England? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I am a big believer in universal healthcare and I'm unapologetic about it. And it is one of the reasons that my husband and I will most likely never move back to the States. Um, he is type one diabetic. So this is an autoimmune disease. It's nothing that he's done. It's a genetic condition. Um, and if we ever move to the States, we're going to have to get some kind of super duper health plan that will cover him for a pre-existing condition because it is expensive. Um, Healthcare here is fantastic and I think it's lovely that everyone understands that people need access to healthcare regardless of your status and regardless of where you're from. Um, there are obviously some downsides to universal healthcare, things like longer wait times, um, you know, having to share a hospital room, things like that. Um, but I would I would greatly sacrifice the, you know, kind of like the fluff, isn't it, of, of private healthcare, the fact that you get to have your own room with your telly. Um, I would sacrifice that, no question, to let everyone have healthcare. And I think it's something that um, we all should do. Again, sorry, very preachy. Um, but yeah, the NHS is a fantastic thing. And I think in times of, especially with the pandemic, you know, you realize how essential it is for people to have this access um, and how important it is and how it's just, as human beings, we, we want others to live. So why not give them health care? Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, and that's just one of those, the big things that like people talk about and it, it's, it's definitely coming up now because like we're in an election. So I figured that would, that would be a good, well, you know, heated question, <laughs> a good, Sorry. a good one to ask about. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and apologies. Cause I know that, you know, a lot of people won't agree with me on it. Um, but it is, it's something that I feel, I feel strongly about and just seeing it here in the NHS, it's just great. Um, you know, it's got its issues. Everything has its issues. There's no question. But yeah, on a whole, I am very, very glad that 
I live here and I pay my taxes to it and it's looked after me and it looks after everyone. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you answering that one. Um, I don't think I have any more specific questions before I move into the wrap up section of Ooh. the episode. Do you have anything oh. that you think you want to share that like I didn't ask about in terms of your life and the differences? No, no. I think I have a funny story about Russia I thought I would share, but I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one. So you'll see if you want to include it or not. Um, but it's one of those, because it's all about culture and, and whatnot. Um, I have a story from Russia about being, and you were talking about kind of being kind of denied, well, not necessarily denied, but you know, when you really realize that you're American, you know, you really realize you're American. But one of the things that when, um, before I went abroad, for Russia. So I was there for um, a, a year during my junior year of university. And we had this big um, sort of before, before we left, we had about a week where we were kind of had this induction. And they talked about, you know, we did language proficiency tests to see where we were. Um, they talked about kind of what we would experience, but they also did this sort of like living in Russia as an American 101. Um, and the emphasis on the course was how to make people think that you weren't American because they're not fond of Americans or they weren't at that time. That was 2008 that I went over. Um, and it was things like, don't smile. So that was a big lesson for me. Don't smile. Um, you know, don't look anyone in the eye, say things like morning or the Russian equivalent. Uh, when you walk, don't wave your arms. Cause we, we wave our arms when we walk a lot, which is a nice little learning as well. Um, but all of these sorts of things that we needed to do so that when someone looked at us in the street, they wouldn't automatically say, you are American and I don't like you. Um, so it makes you a little bit panicked, of course, because you don't think I'm going to go and live here for a year and I might be in a lot of trouble. Um, but I worked at it. You know, I worked at my walk. I made sure that I didn't move my arms around. When we got to Russia, I bought all the kind of the Russian clothing so I wouldn't stick out by having, this was the age of Uggs. This is how long ago it was. Um, but, you know, Uggs weren't a thing there. So I bought the Russian boots, you know, and I bought the Russian hat. Um, and I did my hair like the Russians do. And, you know, I was learning the language and I had gotten to this point where I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm passing, like I'm properly passing for a Russian. Um, and I went into a grocery store and it had been a long day and it had been a bad day. Um, so I really wanted some chocolate as you do. Let's be honest. I just wanted some chocolate. And I just wanted to go home and eat my chocolate and sit in my bed and just relax. Um, I also bought a big thing of water because Russians, um, don't drink a lot of water. They only boil it and have it in tea. They don't really drink tap water like we do. So you can't drink from the tap. So I got a big thing of water and some chocolate and I put it on the, like the, the grocery belt next to me. Um, and the two women in front of me were classic Russians, you know, they're like about six feet tall. They have the big cat eyes, lovely high cheekbones look like they're, you know, just stepping off of, you know, a runway, like model-esque, you know, beautiful, tall things. And then there's me with my chocolate and my water. And they were just buying some Mentos because they obviously didn't eat. Um, and then the guy behind me was buying some beer because he was Russian. They, they like to drink a lot of beer. Um, and I hadn't said a single word, I hadn't said a single word. And we're just walking along. And the guy said in English to me you know, that's not good for you. And I went, what? <laughs> and it was the funniest situation because there was something in that, like that moment where he looked at me and he could tell that I was, I was American. I was not Russian. I was not one of them. I was American just by the nature of what I was buying in the supermarket and the way that I was carrying myself. Um, and I, I think it's, it's one of those, it's, I find it a really, really funny story because it just reminds me of, you can't really let go of where you come from. There's always something there. Um, that people will recognize. And the really annoying thing I would say is that my dad actually, cause you met my dad, my mom and my dad came to visit me, um, a couple of months later and we were walking down the, um, the street in Moscow and some Russian guy turned towards my dad and just started speaking to him in Russian. There was something about me that was American and there was something about him that was Russian. And still to this day, I have no idea what it was. Um, but yeah, that's my little funny story. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a great story, and I'm super glad that you shared it. Um, we can probably keep talking for another hour about, like, your different experiences Sorry. with Russia <laughs> and, like, your different states. And it was like, you know, I didn't, you know, we, we don't have the time. Um, so I'm yeah. I'm grateful that you, you did share that story. So that's really cool. Mm, thanks. 
So now with all of my guests, I ask a really random question before I close out everything. Um, just kind of have a fun, lighthearted last question of the episode. So the question I'm going to ask you, um, because London specifically has a very um, rainy culture where everyone thinks about London and they're like, it always rains. So my question <laughs> for you is like, what is your ideal weather? Ooh, I like that question. Um, yes. Yeah, so I will, I'm going to, as I did with like all of the questions, I'm going to answer it, but I'm going to expand it a bit as well. Um, so rain is not my ideal, that's for sure. And they've got this stereotype of London and the UK. And let me tell you, it is completely accurate. No question about it. It does rain here. It's raining now. Um, it rains all the time. Um, so my perfect weather would be dry, a lovely dry day. It doesn't have to be very warm. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, 100 degrees. We're talking about 80 degrees. Um, but it's somewhere that it's really lovely and warm, but you also have a nice bit of shade and a bit of sun. And that is that is the perfect day and the perfect weather. No rain to be had whatsoever. And a lovely bit of shade and a nice cool breeze to, to cool you down. That would be perfect. That's great. I love it. I like it rains here, not rain. <laughs> yeah, not rain, not rain. But let me tell you, I've bought so many. They, they have a whole part of the culture is waterproof clothing. And I've got it. I, anything that you could possibly imagine, you could waterproof. They do. And I own it. I own it. <laughs> I, I mean, like if you had to carry an umbrella around all the time and instead could just wear things that were waterproof would be so much easier. Oh. For example, you know, we've got the masks now, obviously. Um, I have a waterproof combo mask and um, they call it a snood. It's like a thing that goes around your neck and keeps you warm. I think we call it a turtle. I called it a turtle. That might have been Pennsylvanian. But you know the thing, they're like little circular like scarves, but they're for like active, like going out hiking. Yeah. You know, you sit around your neck. So I don't know what those are called. But I have one that is a combination mask. So you can put on a mask if you go into the shops and snood, they call it here, and it's waterproof. Amazing. <laughs> uh, that's great. So that brings this episode to a close. If you would like to connect with the podcast, you are more than welcome to. I am on Facebook and Instagram with the podcast, and my personal Instagram is also in the description of this episode. The podcast is also on Patreon if you would like to support the podcast. The lowest donation is at $1 a month, so any support is super appreciated. If you would like to contact me or be a guest on the podcast, you're more than welcome to. The email is in the description as well. It is introducing me podcast at gmail.com. I'm always interested in having new guests share different stories, so I would love to hear from you. And thank you to Paige for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week, bye. Bye. bye.